Today, we're going to explore what the Bible says about life after death. And the answer is different than what many people think. As a pastor, I've done a lot of funerals. Funerals for people that I knew very well, including my own parents. Funerals for people that I never even met before. Some for believers, some for non-believers. One time, I was at a funeral. I just finished doing the funeral, and I was talking to some of the adults. And this little boy walked up, and he just kept standing there staring at me. So after a while, I sort of looked down and said hello. And very intently, he said, are you God? I, he was a little disappointed with the answer. Um, but he had a question about what happened to the person who just died. What happened to them? And since I was the one speaking, I must know. And then about, will he die someday? And what will happen to him? You know, it's a question that all of us ask sometimes in our lifetimes. What happens to us when we die? I mean, do we go to heaven? Do some people go to hell? Why can't we contact people who have passed on, as we say? Why is it there's this gulf between us and people? Because of the uncertainty of that question and the answer to those questions, we live in fear of death. None of us wants to die. We live in fear of death. Many years ago, I, I know a woman who one day just came to that realization. She realized that she was going to die someday. And it made her very depressed. Twenty years later, I sat and talked to her as she talked about how she'd missed out on so much joy of life. She'd missed out even on close relationships and accomplishments because every day, practically, she asked herself, is today the day? We all live in fear of death. What happens to us? Well, today, we're going to explore what the Bible says about life after death. And the answer is different than what many people think. Now, you actually may have to reevaluate what you think about life after death and what the Bible actually teaches. But when you discover the plan that the Creator God has for us, why He made us, and there is a life after death, your life today, even with its problems and its issues, can take on new meaning and new vitality and new purpose. And death can lose a little bit of its fear. You know, the most common teaching in Christianity today is that when you die, your soul leaves. You become a disembodied spirit. And you either go to heaven, uh, where you are with God, or if you're a bad person, you go to hell where you are tortured forever and ever. And this is what most Christians believe, and this is what is taught in most Christian churches. The question is, what did Jesus teach? What did Jesus Christ actually teach? Well, in John 3.13, he says something very important here. Jesus, and this is an exact quote, he says, No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Now, when you read this, I mean, for me, the first thing that comes to mind is, in my mind, is no one went to heaven? Abraham. There is no more important person, except for Jesus, in the entire scripture than Abraham. Abraham and Sarah. The one through whom God gave the promises that the Messiah would come from them. In the New Testament, he's called the father of the faithful. Not just the father of the faithful in the Old Testament, but the father of the faithful in the church, in the New Testament. Isn't he in heaven? Well, according to Jesus, he's not. According to Jesus, no one is ascended to heaven except him. You know, the gospel accounts about the life of Jesus and also the book of Acts, which tells the story of, of the... Uh, original disciples of Jesus, how they went out and they taught people and there were great miracles that they did. And you will see that there are a number of times that either Jesus or the apostles raised somebody from the dead, back to a physical life. Someone who had died came alive again. Now, if you believe the scripture, you have to believe that those things took place. 
people actually were dead and the grave opened up and they came out. And you know what's really interesting about every one of those counts? Every single one of them in the life of Jesus or the life of the apostles. That those people who came back from the dead, there is no account of them telling their friends and relatives, let me tell you what it was like in heaven. Let me tell you what it's like to see God face to face. Let me tell you what it's like to be a disembodied spirit. It's wonderful. You know, when Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb, Lazarus had been dead for days when you read the account. And Jesus calls him out of, out of the tomb. And he comes walking out, sort of like something out of a horror movie, because it says he's all wrapped up, you know, and he comes out of there and they unwrap him, and he's okay. What a perfect opportunity for Jesus to say, Lazarus, tell everybody what their future's like. What's amazing is he didn't do that. Lazarus doesn't tell us anything. In fact, the Bible is silent about what happens to people who immediately go to heaven. Well, according to Jesus, we don't immediately go to heaven. Okay, what about hell? Surely Jesus taught about hell and that people who who are rebellious against God, they go to hell where they're tortured forever. Well, there's an interesting thing that's recorded in Matthew chapter 10. And this is what Jesus said. Now, I'm just picking a couple verses here. We're going to have to talk about something more than this, but let's just start with a, a couple direct statements by Jesus. Okay, these are direct statements by Jesus, so they're important. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear Him, who is God, who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Able to destroy both soul and body in hell. When you read the Old Testament, you'll see the word hell. In the Old Testament, the, word, the Hebrew word that's translated hell literally means a pit, a grave. It, it's a hole in the ground. I mean, if you look at the Hebrew Scriptures and you understand Hebrew, everybody goes to hell. Because when everybody dies, they go into a hole in the ground. That's what the word means. Now that's important because it helps us understand that in the Bible, what we call the Old Testament, which was the only Bible they had you know, at Jesus' time, the word that is translated hell does not, does not have the concept of an everlasting burning fire. It's not there. It's not, all you have to do is look up any Hebrew dictionary, and it'll tell you the word hell in the, in, doesn't mean that in Hebrew. Now, here, Jesus is using a different word. He uses the word Gehenna. Now, Gehenna is very interesting because Gehenna, you know, what did it mean to the people he was talking to? Gehenna was an actual place. It's a valley there around Jerusalem. And the thing about this valley is at the time of Jesus, it was a giant garbage dump. Gehenna was a place where they just dumped their garbage, and it burned all the time. This is actually the place around Jerusalem now where Gehenna was. It's not a garbage dump anymore. But for a long, long time, and at the time of Jesus, this was a garbage dump. And they just dumped their garbage there, and it burned, and it burned, and it burned. And if you lived in Jerusalem, and he mentioned Gehenna, the, you know, the fires of Gehenna, they knew exactly what you meant. It's where you threw the garbage. I mean, they could smell it when the winds went a certain way, blew a certain way. So it's not like this was an odd idea. That's why you won't see Paul using the word Gehenna, because Paul was talking to people who didn't live in Jerusalem, and they wouldn't have known what the word meant. But it meant something to these people, because it was an actual place. So what Jesus says is that people can be thrown into Gehenna and there God can destroy both the body and the soul. God is able and capable of destroying both the body and the soul. The soul is the very life, the very life of a person. So we have something interesting here. The teachings of Jesus don't support that you die and go right to heaven. He doesn't say that any place. 
And he doesn't support the idea that you die and go to an everlasting burning hell. To the Jews he was talking to at the time, that would have been a foreign concept. And that's why we're doing the program today. And that's why this is important. If we're going to deal with what happens to us when we die. And is there a future, a future afterlife? And that's why today we have a booklet that we're, we want everybody to get. And we're asking you, to, if you would like this, to further study. Because what the Bible teaches about death and the afterlife is not what many people think. And it takes Bible study to figure this out. And we're not asking you to take our word for it. I mean, I quoted two verses out of the entire Bible. You can't prove anything from two verses out of the entire Bible. You have to look what the entire Bible says about something. And you need to discover what the Bible actually says. It's more than two passages. So, this booklet, What Happens After Death, is very important. You get a copy and you read every scripture. You study every point. And for those of you who are watching, you can get your free copy by simply dialing the number on your screen or going to beyondtoday.tv. You can download it or you can read it directly online. So, if we don't die, let's just take Jesus' words there and go directly to heaven or don't go to hell, what happens to us? What happens to us? I mean, the Bible talks about everlasting life, so there can be a life after this. Is it a matter of um, we just become disembodied spirits? Maybe we go haunt houses. I mean, what do we do? Are we just disembodied spirits? Which, by the way, is the teaching of basic Christianity, or, or most common Christianity, is that you become a disembodied spirit without a body, and you are now this immortal soul must go someplace. And Christianity has an interesting problem with that, and we'll talk about that in a minute. When we go back to the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, he tells his disciples he's asleep. He tells his disciples he's asleep. Now the disciples think what that means is, is that he's resting. And he has to say, no, 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 I'm telling you they are dead. They died. Now, Let's think about this, this idea of sleep. He says, he's asleep. No, I'm telling you, he's dead. He's using sleep as a metaphor for death. You will see this concept throughout the Old and New Testaments. I'm going to read a passage here of what happened, the miracles that happened after Jesus died. After Jesus died, a number of things happened that were dramatic, that let people know that God was saying, the death of this man, Jesus, is really part of my plan. This is the death of my son, the Messiah, the Christ. And here's what it says. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two. This is the veil that was in the, the temple there in Jerusalem. Was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earthquake and the rocks were split. So everybody in Jerusalem knew this was happening. There's an earthquake. Rocks are falling. And the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints, now listen, who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. They're asleep. They come out of the graves. They appear to many. And it doesn't say anything about preaching the gospel of going to heaven. It's not there. That's not what happened. So we find numerous biblical Passages that talk about, and it's both in the Old and New Testament, that death is like sleep. Now let me ask you something. Have you ever fallen asleep? Maybe, I, have you ever, I do this late at night, I'll turn on some kind of mindless television. I'll be watching the American Pickers, and if some of you know what that is, okay? And I'll be sitting there watching that, and I'll fall asleep. And I'll wake up, and there's a different program on. And I'm trying to figure out what happened. And it takes a second to even realize I'm watching something totally different than what I was watching. Oh yeah, an hour went by. You could go to sleep and have no dreams. You have no sensation. You, you wake up and you don't even know the time passed. Now, we really like, as you get older, you really like when that happens because it doesn't happen that often, right? If you've ever had anesthetic, you know exactly what I mean. 
count down 199.98 and you wake up. And it's three hours later. And I mean, you'll never get those three hours back because you have no idea what happened, right? That is how the Bible describes death. Now that's very interesting because when you are in that deep of a sleep, you have no emotions, no pain, no worries, you have nothing, no consciousness. And you know what you also don't have? The experience of time. You go to sleep, you wake up. We always look at things in the terms of our daily existence. But those who die go to sleep and wake up. Time doesn't mean anything. That's important in understanding what death really is. Take some of the fear out of it too. Because we have to understand then what God promises us is that there's a future for those who sleep in His care. There's a future. I mean, God is not going to leave people who die. Abraham, who has not ascended to heaven, is not left there forever and ever. That's not God's intent. Let's look at another promise that was given by Jesus Christ in John chapter 6. Jesus says, And this is the will of Him who sent me, speaking of the Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have everlasting life. So this is the plan of God, that you and I can have everlasting life. This is the hope. But notice He says, when. He says, when. And I will raise Him up at the last day. He didn't say you will have everlasting life because you die and go to heaven. That's not what Jesus promised. What He promises is, is that I will raise you up in the last day. The Apostle Paul talks about that to the church in Thessalonica. Listen to what he says, he writes to them. And, and what happened at Thessalonica, there must have been a number of people who had died. And the church was very discouraged about this. And he says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. It's the same message all through the New Testament. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. He didn't say we wouldn't grieve. We grieve whenever we lose somebody. But it's like we, don't, we still have hope. And here's the hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain, and He thought, and there will be Christians alive when Christ returns. This is all centered on the last day when Jesus Christ returns. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, just like He promised, that we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort each other with these words. This message that death is simply sleep and the message that Jesus Christ is returning to resurrect those who have turned to God is the whole central message of the entire New Testament. Jesus promises, which is in accordance with the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, that He would return to set up God's kingdom on this earth. There is a promise of, the, of an afterlife from God for those who turn to Him through Jesus Christ. Now, there is another resurrection we won't talk about today. There's the resurrection of those who reject God. There is a Gehenna, but that's really, that's really for another, another program. This leads us to some more important questions. Why do we die in the first place? How can I be in the resurrection to eternal life? And what will it be like in the resurrection? Now, obviously, we can't cover all that. We're going to touch on it in the last little bit we have left. And by the way, that's why we're asking you to get this booklet. That's why call that number on your screen and get this booklet. Because we can't cover all this. But this is the most encouraging message you can receive. It seems like when we deal with the great questions 
of life. Many times we go back to Genesis. The first human beings had a perfect life for their creator. They had no sin. They had no negative emotions. They had no fear and they sure didn't have any death. God told them if they chose to go against His instructions, the result would be death. They chose to disobey God. And we've been sinning and dying ever since. We've been sinning and dying ever since. But God didn't allow us to sin because He allowed us. He didn't cause it. He allowed it. He did not allow us to sin and not give us a way back to Him. From the foundation of the world, the Scripture says, Christ was sacrificed so that He could bring us back. To come and live a perfect life. To die as a substitute for our sins. And be resurrected and return back to the Father. You know, you and I die because we're not designed to live in this. You and I were not designed to live in sin. This is not the world God created. War and poverty and sickness and starvation. This is what He designed. And you, how do we survive it? We can't even live to 150. There's people that want to stick themselves in a robotic body thinking that they can maintain their consciousness. You, we can't do that. We can't survive this. But when we return to God, accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as our substitute for what we deserve, and submit to God's recreation of our hearts and minds, there's a promise of a resurrection back to life. A resurrection not to corruptible physical life, but something more wondrous. Now, I mentioned this booklet. There's something in this booklet you need to read. And that is, what it is like to be in the resurrection. What is it like to be in the resurrection? You know, if death is like sleep, it's without consciousness, there's no pain, there's no despair, there's no sense of a loss of time, right? One moment you fall asleep and you wake up. But what happens when we wake up? What happens when you wake up in this resurrection? When Jesus Christ returns and you wake up? Well, I, is He going to start handing out harps? When we float around on clouds? What is it like? That question was asked of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. The church in Corinth was a Greek church. They didn't have a Jewish background. And they believed in the immortal soul. The Greeks all believed in the immortal soul. They believed you died and you became a disembodied spirit. Paul said, no, you get a body. Now, this was just craziness to them. So they write to him about it. He says to the church at Corinth, But someone will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Okay, so you're telling us the body? Well, no, the body's dead because the duality of, of the Greek thought was you have a body, you have a soul. They're two different things. They, you know, and he said, No, you get a body. And, P, and, and Paul goes on and tells them, Look at the sun and look at the moon. Now, it's very interesting because we understand, scientifically know something that he did not know. The sun generates energy. The sun is amazing. It, 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 it generates heat. What is the moon? It's a rock that reflects light. And he said, this physical life is like the moon. That's what this body is like. The body in the resurrection is like the sun with power and with life. So he's trying to explain to them, there is a body we're supposed to get. He goes on, he says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. And then he says, to make sure they understand what he's saying, there is a spiritual body. So when do people get a spiritual body? You go to... Go to sleep. You wake up at Christ's return. And that's why in this same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, known as the resurrection chapter, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. He says, and then we will become immortal. He didn't believe, Paul did not believe we already were immortal. We become immortal when we wake up. So we're just zeroing in on one resurrection. The Bible says there's more than one. 
But we zero in on that one because you can be part of it. So what are we going to do? Christ comes back, and according to the Scripture, the Messiah reigns on the earth. He comes down and He reigns on the earth. And I just mentioned once again, there's a whole section in here called How Eternal Life Will Ultimately Be Offered to All. And it describes a little bit what we're going to be doing, those are in that resurrection. So I encourage all of you to get and read that section. So what will we be doing? Well, then the question is, what will Christ be doing? I mean, the Messianic prophecies in Isaiah, the Minor Prophets, the Olivet Prophecy of Jesus, the Book of Revelation, all describe Jesus reigning on this earth. And He's got a work to do. All those prophecies tell what He's going to be doing. That's what the resurrected saints will be doing. They will be serving Jesus Christ in His work of establishing God's rule on this earth. What will He be doing? Well, a number of things He'll be doing. He's going to be bringing justice and safety for all people. He's going to create a religion that leads people to the true God. He's going to be healing the environment. An end to all war and violence. An economic system He's going to create that rescues the poor. These are all, by the way, well, there's the last one here. An agricultural system that erases hunger. These are all prophecies. You'll find all these things mentioned in the Old Testament about what the Messiah will do. So guess what those resurrected are going to be doing? Helping Jesus Christ do all these things. You want to be part of this amazing future? This is what God is offering to you. Ask God to open your eyes to understand this, that Christ died for you so you can help Him do this. You know, do you want to change the world? You can. God wants you to embrace the reality that you were born to fulfill His original purpose, an eternal purpose, to be His child now and forever in His kingdom. Please call for the booklet offered on today's program, What Happens After Death. This free study aid will help you have peace about what God has in store for all mankind. Death isn't the final answer. Eternal life is being offered to you by the Creator. The promise of life after death is for everyone. God doesn't want you to fear. Order now. Call 1-888-886-8632 or write to the address shown on your screen. When you order this free study aid, we'll also send you a complimentary one-year subscription to our Beyond Today magazine. The Beyond Today magazine brings you understanding of today's world and hope for the future. Call today to receive your free booklet, What Happens After Death, and your free one-year subscription to Beyond Today magazine, one 888 or go online to beyondtoday.tv.